The Swan by Geoffrey Clare The pen felt extremely heavy in Thomas's hand. His grip trembled as his fingers attempted to pinch the small object. It felt as if he were trying to write with a log. This must be what severe arthritis feels like, he thought, and immediately recalled his grandmother in her recliner knitting scarves. Her knuckles were crooked and swollen as if the bones in her hands were made of driftwood. He would stare at them as she worked, unaware of the pain radiating through her hands and up into her arms. She'd smile at him and continue knitting through most afternoons. He'd watched her do this countless times as a boy of seven or eight, all the while eating whatever cookies or cake she'd baked in preparation for his visits after school. Struggling to get his pincher fingers around the pen, he focused and squeezed hard. The tip of his forefinger and thumb were white from the applied pressure. The pen shook, but he had it. He smiled at the small victory. Always the optimist, his wife would say, and she meant it in the best possible way. It was an integral part of his charm, and it drew people to him, good people. He wrote the first words. This is for my wife, Emily, and my two children, Elizabeth and Jack. I miss you more than any words will ever convey. I know you'll never read these words, but perhaps somehow you will feel them from wherever you are. My journey to find you is only beginning. I will. Soon. The depths of his loneliness threatened but failed to pull him down as he drew a long, shuddering breath and released a deep sigh. I can feel it now. It took about two full days. It's a weird tingling in my muscles. My thoughts are muddy, slower. There is no weird hunger or anger like I had imagined. It's just the tingling, like when your leg falls asleep, only all over. The only actual pain he felt was in his joints, but it was substantial. His wrists and knees hurt. He was struggling to make fists, let alone carry something. Freaking carpal tunnel, he thought. That's what it's starting to feel like all over. So, shit, here we go. He smiled at the irony of living this long and succumbing to a damn scratch. A routine check of the barricades in the lobby, a simple dropping of a knife to the floor, and the loud metallic clang that drew the first zombies to his position were the catalysts to the situation in which he now found himself. He had succeeded at reinforcing the front windows by shoring up the lobby furniture against the boarded windows and made his way quietly back to the stairwell. But that one zombie, that one fucking creature persisted, and with no flesh food left, the dead took notice and gathered one by one over months and months until the hundreds became thousands, became tens of thousands, packed shoulder to shoulder as far as he could see. The view from his high-rise balcony overlooked a street that more closely resembled a river of a million heads, arms, and shoulders. His fortifications held for several months. He had made it common practice each morning to check for weak spots. One morning, he had found a slightly compromised board and set about repairing it, a small gap where a plank had partially split. That one three-inch crack in a board and one prying fingernail that ripped the skin on his hand is all it took to begin his ending. He looked up from the paper and took in the afternoon. The sun was starting to drop behind the skyline, casting long shadows and soft orange light across the living room of the penthouse. It was an overpriced 14th floor apartment with long white floors and sterile white furniture. Once Thomas had discovered and cleared this high-rise apartment building, he settled in and called this place home. All things considered, he'd lived here a relatively long time. Maybe too long. His thoughts drifted back through the chaos for the first time. Only five years. That's all it took. The cities fell in mere weeks. No one dared venture in after that, and the few poor souls that did never made it back out. The suburbs didn't take much longer, maybe four or five months Then, over the next few years, the rural holdouts began to dwindle and fall. Occasionally, he would hear rumors of a safe place and set out to find it, 
but the outcome was always the same. He would arrive and find nothing there but death and defeat, always a telling scene of either rushed abandonment or a gory mess that told the tale of a futile last stand. Sometimes he would arrive at a supposedly safe place, only to discover that he couldn't even get close as the rumored destination was completely overrun with the dead. He'd learned to approach quietly and with great care to stay invisible. There just weren't any safe places anymore. They found you, eventually, every time. And the sheer number of dead that arrived in slow, lethal waves was unstoppable. Like flood water that would suddenly rise and, before you realized it, appear everywhere, they came crashing into and then over every fence, wall, and ill-conceived stronghold. And they ate. Thousands of them. Nomadic herds from large population areas that merged and gathered in size as they drifted across neighborhoods and towns. He continued to write while his faculties would allow. There's no real account of how long anything lasted, no records to tell the next generation how this generation ended. Hell, no next generation. And if one had been recorded somehow, somewhere, anywhere, then it was in vain. It would be another artifact of an extinct species. That thought stopped Thomas for a moment, as he imagined the museums filled with the starving, shambling corpses of the animated dead. He pictured the megalithic buildings and statues in places like D.C. and New York, all occupied by a vulgar visage of what humanity had once been. Men in torn suits, women in gore-stained blouses. Children. I haven't seen another living person in well over a year. Anywhere. I used to spend all my spare time searching. Ham radios, satellite phones, billboards, and anything else I could use to reach out into the void. I stopped doing that about six months ago. He paused, realizing it had actually been longer. Humankind didn't make it. I think I'm it. The absolute last of us. He paused and looked up from the paper. The air was profoundly still. Absence suddenly swam through the room and washed over everything. It filled every space with a despair that uncharacteristically swallowed him whole. He became aware of the silence, the absolute vacancy. Even his optimism and inner strength could not combat the emptiness this epiphany carried with it. He was utterly and completely alone, not just in this room or building, not just in this city or state, not even on this continent. The entire world. He thought back to those first days and of the growing apocalypse, and like a rock skipping across water, his thoughts hopped from one trauma to the next. Shielded by the hope that he might uncover some long-forgotten piece of information that would lead him to finding another living person, he let his mind drift back. When the first house fell several years back, it was a shock. Thomas remembered the running hell, sprinting, terrified people fleeing without direction. And then it hit him, a sad fact. He couldn't remember the people's faces not even the ones that were important to him. He closed his eyes and tried to picture faces and only came up with events. He remembered the taste and smell of gun smoke everywhere, so thick and metallic his eyes burned, but not the folks firing them. He remembered his own panic, blindly running and deaf from the ringing in his ears, save for the only two sounds able to pierce it, the muffled staccato pop of various guns and screams. Not the kind of screams you hear in movies, but the kind you might only hear once or twice in your life. The kind that alerts your entire body something horrible is happening. In those slow, adrenalized moments, Thomas had been reduced to his most primal form. Fight, flight, panic, and above all else, survival. The first time it happened, he watched a woman get trampled on a small back porch by the living as the dead slowly moved closer. It happened right in front of him, and he ran like everyone else. That, he recalled, 
was the first slip of who he was. He knew he couldn't help her. He, like everyone else, was terrified and charged by fear to escape. Clamoring out of that big farmhouse, piling through the single kitchen door to the open field in the middle of the night, he had sprinted through moonlit fields and adjoining woods, electrified by terror. Thomas never looked back or around. He just ran, eyes locked forward, only trying to make it through the night. The only saving grace was that it happened in summer and the nights were warm enough. He reconnected with two others after about a mile or so of running, yet now, thinking back, he could not recall their names. They had sat that night in silence, huddled together on the rooftop of a marathon station. When they awoke the next morning, everything was still and quiet, and still no one spoke. Grief, guilt, and the inability to process so much trauma left the few of them that made it out alone and different. Changed. They shared a meager breakfast of vending snacks from the building below and parted ways. Thomas came across their ravaged and mostly eaten corpses mere days later, less than a mile away. Then it happened again. And then again. And pretty soon Thomas grew adept at seeing it coming. He got calmer when he ran. He got better at staying alive. The blessing and the curse he'd eventually discover. After the last place he'd been staying, a warehouse in the foothills of southern Pennsylvania, fell, he was forced to flee alone and on foot. For several short days, he made his way aimlessly north until he reached the Ohio River. There, in the rural outskirts of Pittsburgh, he had found a private dock where a large boat was nestled in and overgrown by surrounding brush and willow tree branches. When he quietly climbed onto the boat, he found the couple that had owned it, an elderly pair, dressed in expensive survival gear that looked bulky and ill-advised. He saw their legs from the knees down were tangled in the extra ropes used to secure a dinghy to the stern. Rather than risk a losing fight due to weakness and malnutrition, Thomas opted to use a pole to push them over the rail and into the waters below. The man, who had clearly been the victim of his turned wife, was an easy victory, as most of his muscle mass had deteriorated and fallen to rot. The woman was another story. She fought against him and almost got past the reach of his pole as it slipped through the soft flesh of her side. He stepped back and swung the five-foot pole like he was practicing staff at a dojo. As he brought it around to her head, she wobbled from the impact, and he quickly stepped forward with a push to her upper body that sent her over the thin metal rail of the boat. From there, things got easy. He remembered almost crying tears of joy when he discovered stacks and stacks of every kind of canned and non-perishable food one could imagine in the cabin and galley. He was now the grateful owner of fresh clothing, equipment, and a soft bed to rest on. He set a drift down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh, always careful not to get close to the shore. He'd encountered a few problems near Huntington, where the dead had clogged the river and made it almost impassable. He remembered at the time, imagining that this is what hell must look like. But it was nothing compared to the view from his windows now. It took well over a month, but he made it to a stopping point when he noticed a small town on the Kentucky side of the river near a downed bridge. He saw the top of a high-rise apartment a couple blocks in from the river and got to thinking. Single entrance, tons of kitchens and supplies, home sweet home, he'd thought and smiled widely. Once again, optimism wins. He picked a place to steer the boat to shore where there were plenty of tall maple and river birch trees lining the banks. The thick woods provided cover that allowed him to go to shore without being seen by both the living and the dead. After a little quiet exploring, Thomas found the high-rise apartment building almost entirely intact. Forty-eight apartments, and most of them were free of the dead. It took him about two or three weeks to clear it completely, but the place was stocked with enough food and resources to stay. So he did and for several months it was the best living he could have hoped for in the middle of a freaking zombie apocalypse. That was then. Thomas laid down the pen and stared at the deep scratch on his left hand. 
The edges were beginning to turn black with necrosis. He stood up from his seat at the glass-topped dining room table, picked up the paper, and let out a long sigh before stepping away from the chair behind him. As he gingerly walked to the living room, Thomas carefully folded the letter and set it in the front pocket of the blazer he wore. The suit, an expensive cut of Italian silk, was one he had pilfered from the walk-in closet of this penthouse that he'd called home for the last year. Making his way from the living room to the balcony, he paused as the phantom smell of baby powder grabbed him and shook him. His children. He breathed in through his nose and realized the smell was still present and even stronger. Without warning, his eyes welled up and flowed over. Without reason to fight it, his tears came freely as his head dropped. His shoulders hitched up and down uncontrollably. He felt grief in a way he'd not allowed himself to in years. He had spent so much time surviving, he believed he had outrun grief, only to find that it was always just behind him. Deep, guttural sobs buckled his knees and pulled him to the floor. He stayed there, curled in the fetal position for most of the afternoon, composing his requiem of tears. Thoughts of his mother and two brothers came first. His last words to his brother were cut off as the phones went down. He was never given a chance to say goodbye or even know what happened to his mom. He could only assume they'd met the same fate as the rest of the world. He'd hoped that the end came swiftly for them and that they were all reunited in some better world. Thoughts of his wife, Emily, to whom he devoted himself entirely until there was nothing left to do but remember her, killed what strength he had left. He recalled the unbearable, his son and daughter, Jack and Elizabeth. He had watched the virus slowly choke the life out of them from scratches and bites received during their escape. In those first days of the outbreak, he had barricaded the doors of his own home with furniture in an attempt to hunker down and stay. But when the dead finally numbered too many to hold off, Thomas and his family made a desperate attempt to escape out a living room window. They crashed to the grass of the side yard with soft thuds. He grabbed his children by their waists and carried them like footballs under each arm, his wife following step for step behind him. Throngs of fleshmongers clogged the streets and spilled into the front yards of his suburban neighborhood. They were everywhere. With his children held tight to each hip, Thomas plowed through his short front yard to his Chevy Tahoe. To his credit, he made it there unscathed. He quickly set his son down to open the door, and no sooner had he let go of him, the dead were on the boy. Jack screamed out as their now undead neighbor attempted to sink his teeth into the back of the boy's shoulder. Not enough to seriously injure him, but enough to infect him. Thomas, with his back to the vehicle, had fought the biter's back with a fearless rage, using his grip on the shoulders of one to deflect another, while his wife gathered the children into the SUV. As he drove, dark, sludge-like saliva dripped from the sleeve of his leather jacket from where one of them had bitten down on his arm. The Tahoe plowed its way down the street, through the neighborhood to the nearby winding State Route 17. The only sounds inside the SUV were his wife and children crying. From there, the nightmare just kept getting worse. That night, under the interior lights of the Tahoe's cabin, they discovered that little Elizabeth had been bitten through her pant leg and was also infected. The guilt he'd carried was too much to bear. As a father, he was charged with only one task, no matter how daunting, and he had failed them. It was never his fault they died, and perhaps some deeper part of him knew this, but the greater part screamed in his head that it didn't matter, and still worse, the two bullets he could never heal from firing. He lost so much of his soul in those first few days, then he lost his wife, watched her slip away from illness less than a year after the children. With no doctor to diagnose what was happening to her, he could only comfort her as she lost weight and strength. Again, not his fault, and again, it didn't matter. It equaled the same. 
The afternoon was almost gone, as were his tears. Thomas pulled himself up from the living room floor, drained of emotion and numb beyond any normal comprehension of the word, and proceeded to the apartment's front door. He walked the outer hall to the stairway in silence and ascended. As he opened the door to the rooftop, he felt the warmth of the sun on his face, and something unexpected happened. He smiled. Two things clicked in Thomas's head as he walked to the edge of the building and gave him relief. One, he would begin his soul's journey to find his family, and believed it would be a short journey at that. Perhaps just a few steps, maybe none. Maybe they were right there waiting for him with everyone else from this world. Two, he could finally let go of everything. Fear, grief, regret, and the fight to maintain hope against hope. His feet left the cement ledge of the building top together as a diver's feet would leave the board in competition. His arms stretched out to both sides as if he was anticipating flight, and his upper torso tipped forward into the pull of gravity. He was falling. Finally. The dry, scratchy moans of thousands upon thousands of undead below reminded him of the crowds he'd heard at the ballparks as a child. In a flash, he was there, and his parents were there. Such a perfect day. Then, flash, his children's faces, their beautiful, beautiful faces smiling at their daddy at Jack's fourth birthday party. Everyone singing, happy birthday to, and then flashes of being in bed with his wife her face looking up at him in warmth, trust, and passion. His school days as a preteen, meeting his wife in seventh grade at a swim competition, Elizabeth, his then two-year-old daughter, sitting in his lap for story time at their local library, his wedding, skipping rocks, apologizing to his mother for breaking curfew, her forgiving smile. Father's Day, the last normal year, his whole life was reviewed in seconds, and it was the most wonderful thing he'd ever seen. And then the roar of the crowd got louder, and he heard his children's excited voices amongst the many. Daddy, daddy! His eyes, blurry with tears of joy, never looked down as he continued to plummet. He knew where he was going, and he had been ready for so long. He would find them. He would find them all. The last seconds of Thomas's fall were spent in anticipation of a homecoming, arms outstretched and legs together with his chest leading the way down, his favorite dive. What has them so wrangled? She asked from the window. The man lowered his binoculars and squinted against the setting sun and replied, I think that crazy guy in the high rise down the street just jumped. Happy birthday, Jeff.